Chapter 12 of A Comic History of England by Bill Nye. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Magna Carta introduced slight difficulties encountered in overcoming an unpopular and unreasonable prejudice. Philip called the miserable monarch to account for the death of Arthur, and, as a result, John lost his French possessions. Hence the weak and wicked son of Henry Plantagenet, since called Lackland, ceased to be a taxpayer in France, and proved to a curious world that a court fool in his household was superfluous. John now became mixed up in a fracas with the Roman pontiff, who would have been justified in giving him a Roman punch, why he did not, no Roman knows. On the death of the Archbishop of Canterbury in 1205, Stephen Langton was elected to the place, with a good salary and use of the rectory. John refused to confirm the appointment, whereat Innocent III, the pontiff, closed the churches and declared a general lockout. People were denied Christian burial in 1208, and John was excommunicated in 1209. Philip united with the Pope and together they raised the temperature for John so that he yielded to the Roman pontiff, and in 1213 agreed to pay him a comfortable tribute. The French king attempted to conquer England, but was defeated in a great naval battle in the harbor of Dam. Philip afterwards admitted that the English were not conquered by a Dam site, but the Pope absolved him for two dollars. It was now decided by the royal subjects that John should be still further restrained, as he had disgraced his nation and soiled his ermine. So the barons raised an army, took London, and at Runnymede, June fifteenth, 1215, compelled John to sign the famous Magna Carta, giving his subjects many additional rights to the use of the climate, and so forth, which they had not known before. Among other things, the right of trial by his peers was granted to the freeman, and so, out of the mental and moral chaos and general strabismus of royal justice, everlasting truth and human rights arose. Scarcely was the ink dry on the Magna Carta, and hardly had the king returned his tongue to its place after signing the instrument, when he began to organize an army of foreign soldiers, with which he laid waste, with fire and sword, the better part of merry England. But the barons called on Philip, the general salaried peacemaker, plenty potentiary, who sent his son Louis with an army to overtake John and punish him severely. The king was overtaken by the tide and lost all his luggage, treasure, hat-box, dress suitcase, return ticket, annual address, shoot-gun, stab-knives, rolling stock, and catapults, together with a fine flock of battering rams. This loss brought on a fever, of which he died in 1216 A.D., after eighteen years of rain and wind. A good excretor could here pause a few weeks and do well. History holds but few such characters as John, who was not successful even in crime. He may be regarded roughly as the royal Pultus, who brought matters to a head in England, and who, by means of his treachery, cowardice, and phenomenal villainy, acted as a counter-irritant upon the malarial surface of the body politic. After the death of John, the Earl of Pembroke, who was Marshal of England, caused Henry, the nine-year-old son of the late king, to be promptly crowned. Pembroke was chosen protector, and so served until 1219, when he died and was succeeded by Hubert de Burgh. Louis, with the French forces, had been defeated and driven back home, so peace followed. Henry the Third was a weak king, as is all too well known, but was kind. He behaved well enough until about 1231, when he began to ill-treat de Burgh. He became subservient to the French element and his wife's relatives from Provence, pronounced Provence. He imported officials by the score, and Eleanor's family never released their hold upon the public teat night or day. They would cry bitterly if deprived of same even for a moment. This was about the year 1236. Besides this, in feeling that more hot water was necessary to keep up a ruddy glow, the king was held tightly beneath the thumb of the pope. Thus Italy claimed and secured the fat official positions in the church. The pontiff gave Henry the crown of Sicily with a COD on it, which Henry could not raise without the assistance of Parliament. 
Parliament did not like this, and the barons called upon him one evening with concealed brass knuckles and things, and compelled him to once more comply with the regulations of the Magna Carta, which promise he rigidly adhered to until the committee had turned the first corner outside the royal lawn. Possessing peculiar gifts as a versatile liar and boneless coward, and being entirely free from the milk of human kindness or bowels of compassion, his remains were eagerly sought after and yearned for by scientists long before he decided to abandon them. Again, in 1258, he was required to submit to the requests of the barons, but they required too much this time, and a civil war followed. Simon de Montfort, Earl of Leicester, at the head of the rebellious barons, won a victory over the king in 1264, and took the monarch and his son Edward prisoners. Leicester now ruled the kingdom, and not only called an extra session of Parliament, but in 1265 admitted representatives of the towns and boroughs, thereby instituting the House of Commons, where self-made men might sit on the small of the back with their hats on, and cry, Hear, hear! The House of Commons is regarded as the bulwark of civil and political liberty, and when under good police regulations is still a great boon. Prince Edward escaped from jail and organized an army which, in 1265, defeated the rebels, and Leicester and his son were slain. The wicked soldiery wreaked their vengeance upon the body of the fallen man, for they took great pride in their prowess as wreakers. But in the hearts of the people, Leicester was regarded as a martyr to their cause. Henry III was now securely seated once more upon his rather restless throne, and as Edward had been a good boy for some time, his father gave him permission to visit the Holy Land in 1270 with Louis of France, who also wished to go to Jerusalem and take advantage of the low Jewish clothing market. In 1272 Henry died during the absence of his son after fifty-six years of vacillation and timidity. He was the kind of king who would sit up half of the night trying to decide which boot to pull off first, and then, with a deep-drawn sigh, go to bed with them on. Edward, surnamed Longshanks, having collected many antiques and cut up a few also, returned and took charge of the throne. He found England prosperous, and the Normans and Saxons now thoroughly united and homogeneous. Edward did not hurry home, as some would have done, but sent word to have his father's funeral made as cheery as possible, and remained over a year in Italy and France. He was crowned in 1274. In a short time, however, he had trouble with the Welsh, and in 1282, in a battle, the Welsh prince became somehow entangled with his own name so that he tripped and fell, and before he could recover his feet, was slain. Wales, having been annexed to the crown, Edward's son was vested with its government, and the heir apparent has ever since been called the Prince of Wales. It is a good position, but becomes irksome after fifty or sixty years, it is said. End of chapter 12